welcome to our brief course on neuroimaging, which primarily will focus on how brain imaging can assist to diagnose patients and to determine brain effects of neuropharmacological interventions. I am Gitte Knudsen, and I am the president-elect of ECMP. Brain imaging is unprecedented to inform about the structure and the function of the brain. It can also show the regional content of specific molecules, receptors, or enzymes. In this small course, we will discuss how two of the most commonly used modalities for functional and molecular neuroimaging can be used for diagnosis in psychiatric and neurological disorders. You will also see examples of how one can objectively assess brain pathophysiology and drug effects. You are probably familiar with how X-rays work. The MRI scanner uses a strong magnetic field and radio waves to generate images of the brain. The brain mainly consists of water, which contain hydrogen nuclei, also called protons. The strong magnetic field in the MRI scanner aligns the protons in the body. We call this a spin. On top of this, the MRI scanner also produces a radio frequency current that creates a varying magnetic field. The protons absorb the energy from the magnetic field and flip their spins. When the field is turned off, the protons gradually return to their normal spin, and this return process produces a radio signal that can be measured by receivers in the scanner and made into an image. Positron emission tomography, or as we abbreviated PET, builds on the measurements of decaying positron emitting nuclides. This is done by having detectors placed in a ring around the head of the person to register the decay both spatially and temporally. In addition to structural imaging, MRI can also be used to visualize functional brain activity. Functional MRI or fMRI, measures changes in blood flow to different parts of the brain, and the so-called bold fMRI signal is correlated to the neural metabolism. Bold stands for blood oxygen level dependent, and in short, it builds on the observation that when neuronal tissue is activated, the cerebral blood flow increases more than the metabolic demand. This means that you can investigate how certain parts of the brain react when the person is exposed to a certain task in the scanner, such as viewing faces with different expressions, for example, angry or sad versus neutral. Bold fMRI can be done without injections of contrast media or traces. Resting state fMRI, often abbreviated RS fMRI, is measured as the low-frequency bold signal in the brain. RSFMRI is generally used to evaluate regional interactions in the brain that occur in a state without an explicit task is being performed. Because brain activity is pressed even in the absence of an ex externally prompted task, any brain region will have spontaneous fluctuations in the bold signal. The resting state approach is useful to explore the brain's functional organization and to examine if it is altered in neurological or mental disorders. Arterial spin labeling represents a semi-quantitative way to quantify regional cerebral blood flow without the need for contrast injections. Instead, the proteins in the arterial blood are labeled by radiofrequency pulses, and as the labeled proteins are carried with the blood through the brain, you can estimate the regional blood flow value. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy is a technique that can measure the brain neurochemistry for selected molecules. Some of the most important are lactate and n aspartate, a marker of um, neurons, the neurotransmitters GABA and glutamine, and creatine, which is a proxy for energy metabolism. PET neuroimaging is a particularly valuable method to investigate how a drug penetrates the brain and to determine the drug kinetics. This methodology requires that the drug target can be imaged with an appropriate radio ligand, but in cases where such a radio ligand has not yet been developed for novel targets, 
PET can still be used to investigate drug effects on, for example, brain metabolism. PET has emerged as a particularly useful method to determine the optimal drug dose of a drug. In this example, you see how the dopamine 2 receptors are blocked to a varying degree in patients with schizophrenia who are treated with different antipsychotic doses of a D2 receptor antagonist. If the patient receives too small a drug dose, the treatment is inefficient, and if the dose is too large, side effects may appear. PET can also be used to estimate neurotransmitter release in response to pharmacological or physiological interventions. This currently applies for dopamine, opioid, and serotonin release. Here is an example of a question you can ask with bold fMRI. How does the brain of an impulsive aggressive person react to provocations compared to a non-aggressive person's brain? In this example, people were instructed to play a game where they can win money depending on how much effort they put into the game. Without any warning, they will from time to time experience that someone steals their rewards. The data tell you that during the provocation, violent offenders activate their amygdala more than non-aggressive individuals do. And striatal reactivity also increases, which might either reflect that provocation is salient or that it induces an altered motor vigilance. Emission tomography, in this case SPECT, can also be used for diagnosing brain disorders. With appropriate radioligands, one can image the striatal dopamine transporters, and this can assist the diagnosis of conditions with dopaminergic dysfunction, such as in Parkinson's disease. I hope that with this small introduction, I have given you a flavor of how brain imaging, in addition to being an important way to assess brain structure, can also be useful in many other ways. Thank you for listening.